Hello everyone, today we talk about the Battle of Torviol, or Torvioli, also known as the Battle of Lower Dibra, fought on June the 29th, 1444, on the plain of Torviol, in what is modern day uh, Albania. Torviol is known also as the plain of Shumbat, as far as I know, pronunciations you will forgive me uh, for that matter. Um, fought um, between you know, the, the, the head of the League of Bledze, um formed uh, shortly before as a League of Albanian noblemen rising against uh, the Ottoman domination led by uh, George Castriotti uh, Skanderbeg, right? One of the most famous, the most famous mm, Albanian figure, let's say, uh, historically. Uh, that is, in fact, connected to the a struggle that he would have led starting from the Battle of Torviol, that is the first uh, victory here with the long series that would uh, occur in the next decades uh, against the Ottoman Empire in a situation that was definitely pretty messed up <laughs> in, in many ways. This is contextually, you know, 1444 is the same year of the Battle of Varna. The Ottomans are swarming into the Balkans and still they have to secure uh, the, uh, you know, the, the wall, uh, the, their positions. Uh, Constantinople has yet to, to, to fall, right? And uh, still there are, there are the, these efforts uh, directed also from, from, of course, locally from these uh, uh, uprisings that are backed by uh, Western uh, Western powers that also interfere, uh, as we were saying just recently, in, in different ways, also um, ambiguously, right? At some point, uh, the Venetians will exploit the same Albanian uh, uh, rebellion to occupy s certain areas of, of the same country. And from, from their perspective, actually, was a solid, sound thing to do, considering what they could invest also in fortifications, naval connections, etc., exploiting this uh, important instability of the Balkans, that also how the Albanian victory of Torviol shows, um, naturally could bring to important turns um, in, you know, the demand in the strategical situation, given that even a clash like this, where fundamentally an army of 20,000, uh, 25,000 Ottomans was, was fundamentally wiped out, uh, could significantly uh, endanger Ottoman consolidation over certain areas and Albania, we would never talk, this is I think the first video we make about uh, Albania specifically now, of course we mention you know these contexts often but you have an idea what the what the country is about, you know, especially in the interland it's fundamentally a mess, right, it's a mountainous area that is very difficult to operate in and uh, the Albanians uh, exploited naturally these uh, in, their, in their favor. Of course, the, the say the decisive factor was the the political and, and social situation. But from a strategical point of view, as the same battle to real shows the terrain was uh, was quite important. And today we make the usual tactical analysis on the base actually of a few sources. Once again, I found mm, an important amount of studies on this. We, we don't know dramatically well what happened, right? So, uh, as uh, always, actually, even when, if you were provided with all the actual sources existing, we, uh, reconstructions are always somewhat conjectural, but overall, uh, I, you know, come to the conclusion that the, the data available is quite coherent and logical from a military point of view to expose how this battle went in a fairly accurate way um, and um, so we we never made videos about for example the Albanian military at this time what they could be mostly like and also uh, very similar uh, let's say armies like, such as the ones operating for example in Wallachia right for both strategically and tactically speaking against the Ottomans uh, also yet we have to cover we talked a lot about the Ottomans though we made several videos about the Ottoman army so from there if you're interested you can take a look and naturally we will cover also these wall other Balkan powers in detail uh, because they're very interesting right in this phase of uh, Ottoman expansion uh, in the peninsula is uh, is very fascinating and overlooked. Um, and the the background is 
the, uh, the the 1443 uh, uh, defeat of Nish, scored by the Hungarians of John Hunyad, in which the, also the Crusading fort would come in its aid by failing disastrously, just as uh, it had happened at Adrianople uh, 50 years before. But uh, the battle that happened in November, so here we are uh, some, some months before, um, uh, I mean, at least the battle was the year before. Then, basically, Skanderbeg, who was a, a, a cavalry commander in the Ottoman army, deserted the Turks to come back in Albania, and uh, together with the, the forces that had been with them, gathered this uh, assembly of uh, Albanian noblemen in the League of Bledsa and to fundamentally arise in, in rebellion against um, against uh, Murad the second at the time being being the sultan now uh, the, um, the there is some interesting strategical background considerations about also the forces involved right uh, here I will go normally for the lower estimates uh, we know the Albanian army being something like 15,000 men strong apparently 8,000 cavalry, 7,000 infantry, which tells a lot about what Balkan warfare was at the time. Um, and um, dom importantly dominated by cavalry, right? Historically speaking, also since, since a long time, you know, the, the Balkans being invested regularly by these um, invasions coming from, you know, from, from, for example, from the Eurasian steppes, but also these other cultures from, from Anatolia were still somewhat semi-nomadic that would uh, bring in, in this new huge frontier characterized by uh, a nightmarish terrain as the, the Balkan interland is um, to this status of perennial instability and warfare which, in which cavalry would in this you know important um, hit and run not just tactics but probably also strategic offensives uh, would um, would you know, be developed in increasingly, um, and providing, in fact, this very uh, numerous cavalry, especially, uh, where it was surely a, an elite, right, a heavy uh, core, and but also this swarms of lighter troops that was fundamentally was what the Ottomans were about, so much that here we're talking about Skanderbeg having been uh, an Ottoman officer, so uh, Albania having basically being namely subdued by the Ottomans. So there was a Turkic influence that is mirrored also in other people's organizations, such as the aforementioned uh, Valachians and even the Moldovans um, uh, at some point, and that uh, relied, in fact, on, on similar tactics with their, their, their major opponents, right? And um, which naturally conditions also some tactical options. The Ottomans are counted between 25,000 and 40,000 men. 25,000 is probably more uh, accurate than we will see this, uh, also considering the losses, because these are numbers that just like in any history source are, you know, you know, some says a number and then some other says another. And uh, of course, there is this idea, as far as I understand, there are not uh, Turkish sources about this or whether, you know, there surely are, but they don't provide the same amount of detail than the, the, the Western ones do. And, of course, from Western perspective, there's always the idea of the, the Turkish uh, horde that is always uh, gigantic, etc. As far as we understand, uh, however, yes, the Ottomans had a, a dramatic numerical advantage, so much that, in fact, the League of Leza had being perplexed in front of uh, Iskanderbeg choice to march only with 15,000 men, but he had privileged quality at some level. And also considering the difficulties of uh, of camping in certain areas, as we will see, uh, Torvioli's vote in this plane within, you know, the as we were saying before, the, 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 the Black Debra Valley, the, uh, that, that, that is somewhat narrow, and the Albanians would fundamentally exploit this kind of mountain warfare here. It's a pitch battle in, in the open, as we will see, but still mm, exploiting, and the tactical course of the battle shows that, well, all, ta you know, terrain features to achieve surprise, etc. So, um, that's what actually conferred the, the Albanians on the long run uh, this you know, 
the, the possibility of achieving the, the tactical victories they did, but on, on the longer run, however, the Ottoman uh, military was too too powerful, and where you know they turned directly to, to Albania in full force eventually after Iskanderbeg uh, death in yeah eleven years, uh, the country was fundamentally um, subdued to, to stay within within Ottoman control. Um, and this naturally informs the way of fighting, because surprise and feints, etc., on a difficult ground, especially for a foreign invader that doesn't know uh, the country, etc., is, you know, uh, it can be definitely uh, advantageous. And this battle I is a proof of that. Uh, however, we don't have to underestimate the Ottomans either, given that they were, and uh, also properly in quality. Right, if you lower uh, the numbers to 25,000, which is more realistic, it's already a, 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 a massive army. This was commanded by Ali Pasha, who was one of the best generals of Murad II. Um, you somewhat increase also the quality of you know, the, 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 the Albanians, given that they, they managed to withstand a com more compact army. Um, and about the composition, uh, you see, for, for the Albanians, we kind of know what what was the numbers overall, and we also have some info about how the army was also subdivided, the name of the commanders, etc. For the Ottomans, we don't quite have the same. So also for the tactical reconstruction, we um, conjectured here some, uh, you know, some properly a specific organization of Ottoman armies that, however, was kind of typical uh, of the time, right? Um, and... Uh, the campaign well, went along with this. Ali Pasha um, left Skopje in June 1444 with uh, this army of 25,000 men heading towards Albania. Um, at that point, Skanderbeg mobilized and uh, stressed the importance of the campaign. It was the first proof of the testing the, the League of Resistance and its military. Um, and um, the soldiers were paid. Uh, religious services beheld was a specific, you know, ideology of resistance there gravitated around the, you know, uh, the local, you know, religious identity, the, the, the local interest and so on, um, cohesion against um, the sultanial uh, government. So Skanderbeg led uh, his army towards the uh, lower Dibra, where he planned to give battle specifically to, you know, block the uh, passage to the Ottomans. It's the plain of Shumbat, right, uh, known as the plain of Torviol, north of Peshkopi. Um, I couldn't identify the actual battlefield. I've seen what the reliefs are around along the river, etc. I couldn't spot exactly the place. I, I may presume, actually, that we're not even completely sure where the battle was fought. But anyhow, the sources say that it was fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the battlefield was somewhat like 11 kilometers long and uh, 5 kilometers wide, but surrounded by hills and forests. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Ottomans were awaited at the entry point, so they already knew more or less where, where would they would have come. So the Ottomans arrived and encamped over a hill uh, in front of the Albanian army. That also was, um, if I remember correctly, encamped over a hill, right? And uh, But the day after would fundamentally descend in the plain to to receive the Ottoman attack because the objective here was fundamentally to lure them into a hasty assault and to ambush them, as as you will see, with a concealed reserve on, on the right uh, flank of the Albanian uh, formation, concealed by, by forests. Mm -hmm. And um, sources... Mm, let's say, stress the fact that the Ottomans were somewhat overconfident, that they feasted the, the night before, they celebrated because they thought that the Albanians were, had come there to, to die, uh, essentially. Uh, whereas mm, uh, uh, Skanderbeg gave the order uh, in the evening to, to essentially turn off old fires and accept the, the guards, all the, uh, the troops to to rest, right? And actually, at night, it was um, um, it was a moonlight that allowed some some operations. Um, Skanderbeg sent some scouting parties 
um, to Reconda's reign because this thing of the ambush actually would have been normal for the Ottomans to carry out, actually, too. And for, you see, I, I preoccupied myself with this because I studied in the past some battles, specifically in my work, which uh, we tend to say, okay, yeah, see, here there's a successful use of concealed um, uh, reserve, an ambush party and things, but, you know, the fact that we, you know, this battle... Surprise, surprise, was won eventually because of the of this concealed reserve. Uh, may not maybe, you know, uh, conceal the fact that also the enemy had that, but maybe it didn't enter in uh, uh, in action for some reason, etc. Because, you know, these battles are not simply, aha, you know, I, I, I'm the smartest one because it concealed the reserve, right? And the enemy didn't, and stupid, and gets destroyed, right? It's too easy. War doesn't work like that, right? Should all, and, and the idea in general... Uh, the Ottomans were masters in these things, as mostly also all these other peoples that fought against them, but, but already by themselves. I mean, it was part of medieval warfare altogether. It was since, especially centuries, it was somewhat always there as a, as a threat, right? So, of course, a good commander had to recon, it, etc. But what do we know that the Ottomans also didn't send scouts or didn't send some reserve? Um, concealed before the battle, right, etc. Uh, we know at night, however, the, the two sides harassed each other. Um, uh, Ali Pasha sent some um, cavalry to 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 insult the Albanians uh, in front of their camp, and Skanderbeg said not to worry and to, to to go back to sleep. Let's say, whereas he also sent uh, some troops doing the same to keep presumably also there the Ottomans awake because the objective was yeah you know that you may never know at night whether it's an, a, an enemy full attack uh, or not as we were saying before the Albanians were quite similar in in strategy and tactics to other people such as the Valachians etc that were famous for these night attacks right think of even about the famed Vlad Tepes uh, Dracul uh, you know he 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 is famous mostly for for these desperate night attacks in the heart of the Ottoman camps, right? That, that because at that point the troops are not deployed, right? The formation it, there is it's a fanatic, almost suicidal attempt, but it can achieve achieving surprise, you know, uh, obtaining important results, right? So uh, the this this is also another thing that happens in old warfare that you want to make a bit of mess of noise to keep the enemy awake and to to tire it down for, for the night after right so these movements pre-battle movements would have been normal and considered also the presence of cavalry in both armies that is consistent for the Ottomans it's somewhat uh, obvious because their armies were loaded with especially light cavalry also light infantry uh, and they brought in troops from different air at this point mostly from from the same balkans and, and anatolia at the same time um so much there was also kind of a tradition of honor usually when you know uh they were fighting in the balkans the right wing uh the first there the was the vanguard during the column formation um faith w w w would have been balkan right whereas uh, the the uh, the rear guard uh, anatolian and when they fought in anatolia it was vice versa not always by the way but it, it was an important deal because there were also places of honor etc so um the uh, the moral of the story is also that these these armies were somewhat similar to each other for for the albanians we can uh think of some kind of heavier you know, nature of, you know, kind of a more Western sense, for example, a bit more solid infantry than what the Ottomans had, because the Ottomans basically were strong at everything except heavy infantry, right? Whereas the Westerners more or less had, were leaning towards, you know, this greater effectiveness of, you know, mostly pikemen and at that point. Um, but if you analyze even the same Battle of Barna, for example, you, you realize that more or less the, the infantry composition weren't so dramatically different. Also because, as we were just saying, uh, many Ottomans were Europeans fighting with their own native, uh, in their own native tradition, just like uh, the guys they were fighting against. There were sure Albanians in the Ottoman army, of course, uh, and this would be a bit the light motive of any like this league uh, eventually had problems because many Albanians also defected at some point fought for the Turks and uh, um, 
So, as always, it was kind of a civil thing, uh, aside from the foreign domination stuff, and it's always very political uh, in nature. Uh, so, aside from these uh, night skirmishes, the battle took place on the following morning, at seemingly at dawn. The battle lasted a few, right, up to nine o'clock, a few hours, actually. It was uh, a quick business, um, and uh, both armies arranged for a battle. So, um, it, it was the Albanians luring the Ottomans in, so they they were probably also the first one who deployed to deploy. Um, so the army composition is fairly fairly simple. It's mostly their combination that is somewhat mm, to to be better uh, understood in the logic, also eventually of of, of of tactics and how they they unfolded during the battle. So. Um, the the both armies were singly divided in three um, in three lines in um, side by side, right? Three main uh, battles. So, from the Albanian side, the center and wings were constituted fundamentally by these three uh, uh, units of uh, cavalry in the front apparently, and infantry in the back, at least. There are other solutions to this. Some say that infantry was also on the side of cavalry, which is an option. But also it's possible that within these uh, divisions, let's call them divisions at this point, um, the the infantry was all stationed in, 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 in the rear of cavalry that could fall back on it in case of, you know, these were mostly light cavalry, as you understand. Also with heavy ones inside, but also, in that sense, the heavy one already supported by this mobile, uh, essentially missile force that would uh, go after them, right? And, or some, we can't say they were, like, mostly missile cavalry, but at least mostly light cavalry, in a sense, right? At least medium light, not coming all ahead. And the infantry could present there with, I don't know, pikemen, targiers, um, hand gunners, uh, crossbowmen, that, that, that's what they were mostly. Also the Ottomans were practically like that, but as we have seen with probably some lighter um, uh, consistence compared to, to the Albanians. These three divisions uh, in a line that was the, the bulk uh, you know, of, of the army, uh, commanded respectively the left by uh, Thopia, the center by um, Muzaka, and the right by Golemi. Now, Skanderbeg was actually in the central one, uh, together with Muzaka at the head of his own uh, bodyguard, so the, the elite uh, of the uh, of the army. I don't know whether in the front properly, together with Muzaka and uh, all the cavalry together, it's possible and or maybe on the distance. Uh, we know at some point he engaged, probably the same Janissaries in the center of the Ottoman um, array at some point in, in the battle. There is not an explicit connection, but it's quite likely to be so, because as we will see, the Ottomans were stationed, like, you know, the correspondence would be that one. Now, um, this, as we will see, for, for so in the front of the central divisions, the Albanians had also deployed uh, 1,000 horsemen um, and interspersed among them, or maybe also in their rear or in their flanks, uh, 1,000 bowmen, right? This is an interesting feature because as far as we understand, so you see, uh, by the way, these uh, three divisions were um, something like 9,000 uh, strong altogether, so they were normally 3,000 each, uh, 1,500 horsemen and 1,500 infantry, roughly, per division. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's where they were the consistent bulk. So when you think of, of this advanced, so this kind of vanguard of, of 1,000 horsemen and uh, 1,000 uh, archers, you understand that um, this was, mm, you know, probably not capable of covering the wall front of all the three divisions, right? Uh, and it was likely stationed properly in the front of the central one, right? The reason, as we will see, is that the Ottomans made habitually use of a consistent amount of uh, light cavalry and infantry in the front of their um, heavier troops, let's say in the first line, 
so it's as if this vanguard in the Albanian army would have been a sort of equivalent, um, in spite of the fact that normally the the Ottomans would use much larger numbers for that, because the together with the Asinki and the uh, Adzab, they were respectively horse archers and the light uh, infantry, were also mostly skirmishers, um, they would mm, harass the, the enemy front ranks. So this Albanian vanguard, calling it like this, was... Uh, somewhat something to absorb all that that fire in a way, but being unsatisfactorily consistent in order to properly withstand the uh, uh, you know the entire Ottoman first line made up of, of such missile troops, it was probably compacted just in, in width uh, in, in corresponding to the the front of of the central division of the Albanian army, which means that the other three the other two divisions on the wings were fundamentally uh, without uh, without such screen in their front. Uh, and probably the, uh, the Ottoman first line with the horse archers and the light infantry uh, was something like, mm, probably extended the same width of the Albanian um, s second line of one of the three divisions, and or something less, let's say, but it would exceed, as you understand, in width by far, this Albanian vanguard, right? Reason for which, uh, at least in some studies say that probably the Albanian army had uh, its wings a slightly uh, advanced um, compared to the central division. Uh, this would create a sort of, um, you know, greater mm, compaction f for, uh, let's say, properly securing better the vanguard. The objective being uh, not to let it easily annihilated by uh, some kind of uh, encirclement movement by the same first line of the Ottoman army. Uh, so this also implies naturally that the front line, uh, that the uh, the cavalry in the front of the wing divisions in the Albanian army would have had to to engage partially uh, the the extremities of the the Ottoman first line in the process, right? But this would, let's say. Mm, confer to the Albanian vanguard this greater capacity of, of halting, let's say, the first onslaught, especially the, all these uh, terrible harassment of, of projectiles coming from, from the Ottoman front that was, you know, um, as expandable troops fundamentally. So, so these, you can imagine what these guys in the front would think about the world business. They were sent in a kind of a suicidal uh, mission, if you want. Um, still considering, however, that uh, the Ottoman first line was not meant properly to engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat direct. Of course, when opportunity arose to, to, to exploit, let's say, a break in the line, a collapse in one, one unit, one section, etc., they would, they would probably exploit that. But still, these were light troops. So they were, they were meant, as it happened often in... Um, in these uh, Asian, um, also uh, Eurasian steppes army to kind of harass the enemy, but to eventually, when they exhausted their missile, to literally go away, right? Normally it would have been to loot the enemy camp, right? Going past the, 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 the enemy formation, or uh, retreating on, on the flanks and, let's say, discovering the, the second line, the one properly with the Janissaries and often also with some kind of field fortifications and the heavier cavalry, right? This is kind of the tactics of the display that Nicopolis famously enough to, in that case, to actually counter the, uh, the crusading heavy cavalry charge, right? That would was conceived to go straight through, right? And eventually crash into the middle, risking also you know, given that this, this, this first line had opened in the flanks to naturally receive fire from, from the flanks as well. Uh, this was not the case, because the Albanians were not in for a, a, um, a frontal attack into the Ottoman line. Uh, they were actually the ones luring the Ottomans in, into attack, right? So that mm, this their vanguard could be used also some sort of screen, maybe, maybe not for visibility, because as we will see, the, the Ottomans were still on the hill when the Albanians deployed, so they could see from the above literally what the wall deployment uh, was, and they were confident that just numbers would be enough uh, at that point. But let's say it was a way also to to uh, 
to lure further the Ottomans, right, to, to engage and to, to, to disorder also this, this front rank, to create more confusion, right, to, to make their, to render their life kind of more difficult without exactly knowing whether the enemy was, was attacking or not. And this is important because um, technically the, the Ottoman army was conceived uh, also to, to, to count at that point on the Western, you know, uh, uh, on a Western hasty attack directly into its lines, right? And therefore, in a sense, at this point, they were properly meant to, to attack themselves. Um, so this was the deployment. Then Skanderberg deployed a reserve in the rear of the formation with cavalry and infantry that were probably deployed in, uh, di distributed within the division in the same way of the other major three ones, uh, with cavalry in the front and infantry in the rear. There is something we could say about that later, especially for the need of a fresh cavalry reserve that could pursue. So an unspent one that could pursue the, the, the fleeing enemy. But definitely the most important feature uh, here are the 3,000 cavalry hidden by Skanderbeg um, in, the, uh, in the woods on the right of the formation. So as you understand here, the, the battle is, um, is fought in, in, in the valley. So the, the, uh, the, the length of the valley is the, the, uh, the axis that goes uh, perpendicular to the front of the two armies. So um, the, the Ottomans would advance in the valley and um, expose their left flank to this hidden reserve that apparently was not spotted, or even if it was spotted, would still um, function pretty well, as we will see. Um, Albeit some sources also say that the Ottomans, um, that the Albanians didn't achieve full surprise about that. And it's naturally plausible, because, um, you know, uh, f first of all, everybody knew that uh, such reserves could be employed, right? And still, it, it's not so easy to... Uh, it is true that when you attack an enemy from the rear, uh, from the flank, uh, the cohesion of formation is not even so important. So it's possible that, you know, that all these, you know, 3,000 horsemen are not a few. Hidden in, in the woods could come out very disorderly and simply, uh, you know, clash with, you know, press, pressure the, the Ottoman left with just numbers, right? But still, there are a lot, right? And they, they as far as I understand, they were also scattered actually in multiple units with different commanders. The command of Skanderbeg nephew, uh, Hamza Kastrioti, right, so here we indicated with the name of Kastrioti, just like uh, Skanderbeg. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, the decision of, of a reserve of a concealed uh, unit attack is always quite important because you have to really identify the culminating point of the attack that is the riskiest for both contendants, right, because not only the enemy has fully committed its own fort, not completely, actually, as we will see with the Ottomans, and there are some some tactical remarks to make, um, and and also you know the moment in which your own army is the closest to collapse, right, the en uh, to the enemy onslaught and launch the attack to maximize there the the impact on the the major the the, the largest amount of enemies po committed as possible, right, and um, this was the the bet, right, the Skander made for this battle, considering the the really important numerical inferiority of the Albanian army. So, yeah, th this is pretty much it. For, for the Ottomans, uh, here I would like to point out that, yeah, we have an idea that there were somewhat three lines, right? And the first one was surely composed by lighter troops, the second by heavier ones, and there was a, a third one in reserve. And here I uh, represented it uh, in with the usual scheme that usually uh, an Ottoman formation would represent the sultanial one that probably also the, the lesser ones of the Pashas, etc. would actually field in the same way. So we have that first line we were seeing before with the uh, Atsinki um, uh, horse uh, uh, archers in the end, the, the Azab light infantry. Um, as we were saying before, this had a s kind of harassment slash screen function, right? It was not meant to hold. Uh, but just to, to exhaust what normally the Westerners fielded as the the cream, like the elite, as the heavy cavalry. In this case, it's not quite present. If not, you know, in the 
in the uh, three main division of the Albanian army, the second line, that truly had such heavy cavalry, but they were not all about that. At least numerically, they wouldn't, you know, uh, they wouldn't have that kind of shock power that an average, I don't know, French line, I don't know, think about the Burgundians, the Westerns at Nicopolis but would have. Um, simply because Albania was, like, also former heirs of the Byzantine Empire, they didn't, hadn't quite seen a, a true feudalism like in the West, so the aristocracy was somewhat less uh, elite than, than the rest, so this means less uh, numbers in heavy cavalry compared to the Westerners, but they of course had them, but this enforced the world tactical, uh, they informed the world tactical uh, differences uh, for that matter. Then the second Ot Ottoman line is was uh, usually formed by the Sipai cavalry on the, this heavy cavalry on, on the uh, two wings, right? Uh, uh, as you can see, and the central one would be made up actually of Janissaries, mostly infantry, and normally the Janissaries would, um, in front of these, uh, of, of an attacking enemy, would entrench themselves. Also because the the commander, often the Sultan himself, was was there, right? So that was, you know, the, the greatest precaution not to make the, the Sultan die in battle and to retreat. Um, and Janissaries were mostly infantry. There would be, as you know, this kind of elite corps by some standard, but they actually were kind of an army. Uh, on their own, they had all tactical specialization. They would have artillery as well. Uh, we know um, the Ottomans just at the Battle of Varna made, uh, would make use the same year of that. We don't have inf info about artillery on this battle, as far as I understand, but probably both the uh, the Albanians and the Ottomans had, right, and prefer possibly the Ottomans more. Uh, but we have no info of particular bombardment. Also, consider that bringing artillery in the, ma in the mountains there is a puts an important logistical strain, so probably wasn't such uh, a artil great artillery park, it's not even from the Ottoman side. And and this second line would be the toughest one, the one that would probably engage directly, and in this case probably charging to the Albanian ar uh, array to, to, cr to crush it. Um, the, uh, so Ali Pasha was commanding actually from from the same line, probably among the Janissaries and uh, d their heavy cavalry. In the rear, uh, there would be essentially cavalry reserves, places as you see here inserted, it, it's all conjectural, right? But um, while for the second Ottoman line we know that there were kind of like at least the equivalent in, in width to, to commit uh, against the wall, like the the three um, the three major Albanian divisions of so the the all the, the Albanian uh, front with uh, the um, for the rear we don't really know how many troops were there how they were deployed etc here there were probably cavalry with some elite still to send in maybe in the critical moment and uh, maybe some other say more agile cavalry in the rear consider that the Ottomans were famous for encircling the enemy as as uh, as much as they could so probably on this battlefield i mean you'd be surprised how tiny after all on a width of five kilometers like the uh, still the which is not excessively much but you know the the single uh, battle lines can be like men are somewhat compressed in a few hundred meters it's not something particularly extended but still, considering that the, the narrow valley, the, the valley had this kind of, um, you know, uh, cliffs and forests, etc., you know, it would narrow it down further, and there wasn't probably this dramatic uh, room for maneuvering in this sense. And still, the Albanians, however, counted laterally on the most extreme end of the battle field, uh, presented by, by the forest itself, where that important number of 3,000 cavalry were stationed. So even if the Ottomans would have, um, let's say, encircled them somewhere, the uh, uh, in this case on on the right, properly of the Albanian uh, array, the, uh, the, the 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 reserve, the concealed reserve, would have outflanked them for them fur. Now, what is interesting about this is that naturally, you see. Uh, on a battlefield, you don't, the, the Albanians knew this range, surely, etc. They had probably Skanderbeg had pre planned that position, etc. Uh, but it's still meaningful that the reserve came 
um, from uh, essentially from uh, on the right so only on the one side of course of, of the formation so at that point of course it can't be like just uh, the the only possibility because you don't necessarily find all the perfect spots where to hide um, such a large amount of troops right that might have been a forced decision but naturally that in informed somewhat also the probably the same composition of the Albanian army right as we will see the Albanian right wing division would have problems during the battle would almost uh, break right and it's possibly no coincidence right it's possible that Skanderbeg may have actually weakened that division to make the Ottomans exactly charge concentrate more force on it so that the reserve by Amza could could literally fall onto a very mm, you know very high concentration of enemy troops for that matter right um, but it's just an hypothesis because sources do not tell us. But surprise, surprise, you know the the the, the reserve, the concealed reserve was on the right, and the right wing uh, some was somewhat more in trouble. It may be an indicator of maybe less, not necessarily less or, um, or I mean less numbers, but maybe less qualitative troops. Right, we we don't know actually, because it's still a risk. Right, it's still a gamble. Right, it doesn't take just to conceal a reserve to make things work. Because if, let's say, the, your right wing breaks uh, before the reserve intervenes, still you're you're in freaking trouble. And maybe as far as we're as far as, as far as we know, as we were saying before, the Ottomans maybe had their own concealed uh, units as well. But maybe they they broke first and they couldn't employ them. Right, and and the fact that uh, this in fact didn't happen maybe is the reason that uh, that doesn't actually mean that maybe that they weren't there. I mean that that that's what I what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, this was practically the the deployment. So uh, the army was marshaled, as we said. Skanderbeg would not permit the trumpets to give the signal for battle until he saw Ali Pasha advancing. Um, and there's a very interesting passage in which the, the Turks fundamentally sent in some um, some cavalry uh, ahead of the rest, right? But uh, they were repulsed by the Albanians and retreated, right? And Skanderbeg at that point thought this might have been a feint, right? And so he prevented his men from giving chase to the Turks, Right and sent a body of horsemen to marshal his troops back to their places. This was fundamental because, as we were saying before, the Ottomans probably were were in for some trick themselves, and um, the the wall mm, the wall logic of the uh, the Albanian air array was to receive the Ottoman onslaught, right, and therefore not to rush forward, losing cohesion and having problems to come back to, to form a, a valid bulwark against the Ottoman attack, right? They had all to stay, and th this was very difficult to do, because uh, it's not easy to tell the average 15th century Albanian horseman what to do, right? The, here there is not a um, a state with a with a solid, you know, autor central authority capable of maintaining a uniform discipline uh, in, in a professional army. These are all basically Albanian clans brought together and uh, by this common interest and that's basically what keeps them what, that's the glue that keeps them together in, 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 in the battle as well. Right? So you can imagine also the so that's what Skanderbeg's charisma and authority military prowess were, were a big deal. By the way, the Albanians had already defeated uh, the Ottomans in some battles were also important, but at this point, the, the, truly, the, the only Europeans to have s substantially defeated the Ottomans in battle were the Albanians, right? And this was also the reason why, uh, at some point, they, they would be also sponsored back by, by uh, external powers after, especially Skanderbeg victories, starting from this one. At the end of the day, however, without much result, because as we were saying before, there was not much of a, you know, Counter consistency in this concept to, to oppose to, to, to the Ottoman Empire as it was already been you know extended on a, on a very important amount of of, of provinces. So uh, this um, so I don't know whether that Ottoman body of cavalry to charge first is 
like uh, because we know that this happened more or less all over the Albanian line, right? Um, as far as I know, I there is no info, specific info about the vanguard that uh, Skanderbeg has stationed in front of the central division. Uh, probably they they work the way they had, right? They also had probably not to 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 pursue the enemy. They were given order like that, but at at the end of the day, they were conceived to to slow down the Ottoman assault, maybe to to try some kind of hit and run tactic themselves on a on a limited um, run on a limited terrain. Um, but let's say the important was to maintain the cohesion of all the army right and it's possible that in fact this first ottoman wave was in fact the, the one of the first line proper that there weren't single detached parties or further ottoman vanguard were probably this uh these harassers that were probably present in large number uh and that would therefore boast also in the in the albanians the desire for for revenge for running after them etc and that's why uh, here skanderbeg's uh, uh, marshalship managed to to keep uh, the the lines uh, cohesive, right? And we don't know what was the fate of the Albanian vanguard and the Ottoman first line, right? Presumably they simply melted away after they they exhausted their their missile capacity. Uh, there was, in this sense, a sort of skirmish before the battle um, began at its fullest, right? And normally they would run in back uh, in uh, loose order within the the corridors existing within the, the the battle lines and yeah we think it's realistic uh we don't know much more about that we, we don't know about attacks on enemy camps during the battle but just you know the albanian one at the end against the turkish one we just know that the ottomans uh, finally sent in their second line, right, the, the big guns, uh, not literally, but probably, if there was some artillery, it was probably there, anyway, uh, but surely the strongest force of their army against the second Albanian line was also the strongest force of the Albanian army. Um, as we've seen, there were probably, from the Ottoman side, three divisions that equaled somewhat the three Albanian ones, and, and therefore, that's the one that were probably properly the big fight began right uh, between the the most dense and solid um, uh, f forces of, of the two armies and um, initially it seems that uh, either the, uh, the 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 left in uh, central Albanian divisions managed to to push back respectively the uh, Turkish right and central uh, divisions but more realistically was whether the the Albanian right wing division that was uh, if not pushed back but started to, to crumble against the uh, offense of to suffer heavily from the offensive of the um, of the Ottoman left division right and this was a crit the critical moment the culminating point of the uh, the attack because the ottomans had mm, as far as we understand didn't advance evenly right we have to look even at the ottoman side these were not mm, completely you know fully drilled armies of you know troops that would obey to to the uh, to the single order literally especially the first uh, line was made up of rabble in a sense, right? They were just, you know, good at doing what they did because they were free to, to, to harass, to skirmish, etc., going back and forth. Traditionally, these were kind of ethnic contingents that had always, you know, had that kind of traditional fighting style, etc. The second line was surely more, way more disciplined, including the Janissaries and also properly the, the elite with Ali Pasha himself committed in, in the battle. Uh, it seems that Skanderbeg himself attacked the... Um, the Ottoman center, right? So he probably fought together with Muzaka uh, against the Janissaries uh, in, in combat. Um, but, I mean, the, mm, it's possible that all in all, the Ottomans somewhat, first of all, either rushed properly as the as Kanderbeck had wanted, 
right? Because uh, at that point, uh, what is fascinating of this is that Skanderbeg might have awaited for the Ottoman onslaught at the top of the hill where he was encamped. He said he had descended on the plain. So the objective was properly to call the Turks in saying, you know, look, we don't care that you are superior in number to us. We even descend from our defensive, best defensive position uphill to face you uh, in, in the plain and, uh, and, and so that we, we don't care about your, your superiority. The Ottomans at that point said, okay, it's done, right? They even abandoned their advantageous position. Why? It, was, it was said that the Pasha said, while well, advancing, what are these guys doing, right? You know, uh, they have come literally here just to die, to be overwhelmed by us. And so the picture we get is, first of all, that the, the Ottomans might have simply rushed against their foes, kind of heated by, you know, overconfidence, etc. But also properly that their army didn't have this dramatic you know, connection with all the various, uh, you know, uh, with the command chain in the first place, but probably the cohesion of the units, etc. We don't have to think the Albanians were were anything better in that sense. So also the defensive position had some purpose in this regard. But as you understand, the main objective was to trick the Ottomans, exactly, into launching a full attack, uh, to launch the, eventually the... Uh, the surprise attack of the concealed reserve, and as far as I understand, sources at some point say, or and or it is being reconstructed that the Ottomans, by the time of uh, the reserve uh, of the Albanian reserve attack, hadn't been fully surprised, or at least th this way possibly mean that maybe their their third line uh, had not been committed yet. Normally the concealed reserve attack came at the very end, right? Especially in, in Western warfare, usually the, at least the, the ultra-elite was in, in, in the last line, right? And there would be a much less um, flanking movement than these in areas like the Balkans, etc. Uh, because of the absence of light uh, cavalry in, in practice. Um, so they would mostly leave the end to attack the enemy elite, well, quote, uh, you know, guard lower that it's uh, rear its flanks by the reserve. Um, here, it might have been less possible, less practicable, right? The the Albanians probably knew that, and, and we have to probably believe ourselves that the, the best, the bulk of the Ottoman army was concentrated in the second line, which is way more than just plausible, because the Ottomans normally fought like that. But surely there was a, this third line in reserve that was still fresh, could intervene in a way or another. So um, it's also possible that maybe uh, the Albanian reserve didn't attack all in one block, right? So the Ottomans had time to see that there, you know, the Albanians were attacking from that side, but that there were probably more of them to come. And we also know that they themselves launched in a pre-arranged fashion, you know, mm, several attacks exploiting still the fresh reserves that they had, right? Um, but the attack of the Albanian reserve, however, worked out successfully because during the the clash. The uh, the enemy, uh, the, the Ottoman left wing, was fundamentally attacked on two sides by uh, the right, uh, I mean frontally was engaged with the Albanian right di uh, wing division, and on its own left uh, attacked by the, uh, the Albanian reserve, which is already a big deal. Normally, what is fascinating is, is, is that the Ottoman left actually held on went on fighting, which is which is rare, because normally uh, when a unit is attacked on two sides, it, it, it breaks almost immediately, right? So probably, yeah, maybe they didn't last excessively long. But considering the fact that this might have been actually heavy cavalry and that the Albanians there didn't feel probably maybe the same equivalent and or that maybe the same Ottomans had some other segment tactical segmentation within the unit, so maybe some infantry as well, or lighter troops, etc. Um, there wasn't maybe that kind of punching effect from uh, from the the reserve intervention that we may think properly. So it went on. The point, though, is that still it's in. Uh, this is a bit speculative because at the end of the day, just the fact that they went on fighting with the 
uh, with two phalanx uh, engaged is remarkable. It's however at this point that we know that the Ottoman army probably sent in all its forces, right? Uh, and especially on, on the left uh, to properly support uh, their own wing that had been attacked from two sides. So much that the same Skanderbeg gives the order, uh, even though some say that it was his same nephew that commanded both the concealed reserve and the reserve behind the main formation, to send in fact the latter to, to support its own uh, right wing at the same time. So its right wing should have been somewhat uh, victorious. I say I don't think we're properly told that um, that the um, that we. I think sources say just that the uh, reserve behind. Uh, I mean, in the third line, let's call it in this way, intervened, but we don't know how, right? We actually are told that this one was somewhat decisive. And given the spaces, it's possible that some gap had formed properly also uh, for leaving enough room for maneuvering. We're talking about large spaces, not the average gaps between the various divisions, properly between the Albanian center and the Albanian uh, right wing, right? Uh, either because the, uh, the, 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 the Albanian center was beginning to push back the, the Ottoman center, uh, or because um, the, the, actually the, the Albanian right wing had, uh, you know, um, fallen back a, a little under the, the, uh, the initial Ottoman onslaught, and it's plausible therefore at this point that the th uh, the Albanian third line actually intervened on, uh, as you can see from from the from the map, on the let's say right of the Ottoman left wing, right? So attacking it from three sides. At that point, doesn't matter how much the Ottomans would have sent in to help, the Ottoman left began to crumble. Mm -hmm. We don't have mu much other details about the whole thing, if not that gradually, um, with the collapse of the Ottoman left, also the center and the right began to uh, to crumble and, and rout. Right, so that's literally how the battle ended, meaning that uh, yeah, without, you know, you're exposed, you see, um, if you, if you as you see here, even from the picture, like, imagine all, also the forces that the, the Albanians had committed in this uh, clash. It would be fundamentally something like, uh, like, yeah, I mean, this here we're talking about at least 5,000, even more against the the, uh, the Ottoman left, so in the moment in which this broke, the, the center found its, le its, its um, flank um, uh, uncovered, and with relatively, yeah, somewhat spent troops, and that's why we don't know whether some reserve had been held. I've seen some reconstruction that said that just the infantry of the Albanian third line had actually uh, come in support of the fighting units and that therefore in this way the cavalry could still be fresh to pursue the enemy. It's a possibility. I haven't counted it because mm, I we don't simply don't know. It's possible here it, I represent it otherwise but it there is nothing specific. Like here it's about the cohesion of the troops, not not much whether it's infantry or cavalry first, etc. Cavalry could have been also more effective to properly you know, in, intervene in the moment in the areas of the line that had that was suffering the most. In any case, the Ottomans see literally uh, their their left broken. The enemy is warming uh, through uh, the the gap, and and this is something that uh, you know brought obviously to the collapse of the entire formation. And the battle was literally won like this. So the reserve functioned pretty well. It was it was a hardly it was a closely fought uh, encounter, right? You know, you don't have to think in this sense that the Albanians scored an important victory. Now they, um, the same Ali Pasha managed to escape barely, right? Because he fought uh, apparently valiantly in the center, right? And was expected from him. he was a good commander. 
Um, and the uh, we know that, in fact, some some units of the the Sandra, probably the Janissaries, has put had put up an, an important resistance during the battle. Also, um, the uh, I, uh, I think I don't remember whether from from the center or from other 300 soldiers that taken refuge back to the camp were were spared because they threw away their arms and Skanderbeg decided to uh, to 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 let them live. In any case, the Albanians uh, took the the Ottoman camp with an important amount of loot, right? Um, Eventually, we know that Ali Pasha referred to Miranda II it was the, the the fortune of war that had decided the battle, not his incompetence, right? And I don't think there is any specific mm, evidence to. I mean, the narrative is yes that the the Ottomans were overconfident, etc. But what do we know? Like it's it's the narrative of of the stories of of, of of the Christian sources that, of course, would say, ah, you know, look at these ones, you know, they were so. Arrogant, etc. But actually, they, the Ottomans fought well enough, and um, there might have been some incompetence, as, as there might have not been. Right? We we don't know. Right? Of course, it's very complicated just to maintain tens of troops on the field and to make them work well. So um, they 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 both fought well. Right? This is at least what I, what I get. Surely, however, the odds were more against the the Albanians. So this means that. However, they they whatever they did it was was functioning right, <laughs> right. Aside from we can think that there was even a all that difference in quality between Ottoman and Albanian troops, right? Uh, even stereotypically, if you want to think that Albanians were a little bit heavier in in nature, but you know, it's you know it's almost speculative and based yes on analogy, but. Not so evenly, right? These were not, I don't know, Serbians or Hungarians that were a bit more kind of Western influenced. These were similar, more similar, as we we're saying, to the Valachians. They, they fought also. They were much more influenced also by Byzantine war and the same Turkish warfare, as we were saying, right? But you know, it's plausible also that they were heavier. There's, there wouldn't be anything strange historically, anyhow, than compared to the Ottomans. Now, speaking of losses. That surely quantify the thing. You see, um, battle lasted three hours, and um, the um, most realistic account would speak of seven thousand Turks killed and five hundred captured. There are some sources that claim that basically the entire Ottoman army was was killed. Things like that: uh, twenty-two thousand killed and two thousand prisoners. Uh, it's too much, right? Probably they weren't even, you know, so many. But uh, the um, maybe even the, the the Albanians were less. Uh, we know, however, this is very important for measuring a victory. The trophies of war: twenty-four standards captured, together with the camp, with the loot, and so on. The Albanians seem to have suffered seven hundred eighty dead. Right, I, an alternative source uh, says one hundred twenty. Plus 2,000 wounded. It, some some authors say that Albanians might have suffered up to 4,000 casualties between between dead and and wounded, right? And yeah, this is pretty much it. Eventually, uh, Skanderbeg went on remained on would remain on the field for for one day to secure the victory because also there was always the risk of saying you know. Have you really defeated the enemy army? Couldn't they come back? It's especially if, if a lower the guard can be very risky. But eventually, he um, he actually led his army into Ottoman-controlled ha- territory. He also mounted the infantry with, on, on the horse, the, the captured horses of the Ottomans. Things went on, and um, the, the there was uh, the, the 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 news of victory arrived uh, in Europe because that was an important. Indicator, however, of, of some uh, Ottoman weak point, considering also that the Crusade of Varna was on the way. It was a lot of interest in what, in fact, the same Skanderbeg was exploiting that uh, that situation, as you understand. Um, so the story here, how f- things went for today's video, is, is not particularly important. What can we assume from this battle? Well, mm, it, it's a very interesting one. I must say, because um, it's uh, in spite of the few data that 
at our disposal, after all, it tells something very uh, concrete, right? What I maybe forgot to tell at some point, I digressed, is that there is also this info about the somewhat concave front that the um, yeah, I actually said it, that the, the Albanians may have created by advancing the wings, right, so to take uh, not properly the enemy in the, you know, in between, but rather to uh, to, pro to to protract, let's say, to, to, to support better the vanguard duty to spend a bit and to, to, to disorder a bit the Ottoman array in the first uh, attack, probably because they feared the, the, the mass attack itself. As we were saying before, it was actually a great gamble to even descend from that hill. I mean, Skanderbeck in this was, you know, showed uniquely a capacity and a courage that, you know, he knew he could count uniquely on his army in this, but it's pretty risky, right? And this was the beginning of the league. It was a way to show, uh, it's always political, it was a way to show how much the Albanians could achieve when united, even with, against the odds, apparently against the Ottomans. Skanderbeg himself, as we've seen, had just left the Ottoman army himself. He knew what, what was the situation, what was the quality of the troops, etc. So he had kind of an idea of how to, you know, he's very fresh from Ottoman experience to know what he could expect from them. So he definitely, that definitely also played a part. Um, the reserve uh, employment is always very fascinating historically. And um, we get, um, I mean, also in the difference of in numbers, I would say that probably it was less than we uh, we think. I mean, the 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 sources are mostly Western, so they tend to aggrandize the victory, um, which was surely a, a great victory. But I mean, the the opposition between this the few and the many, right? All these things are probably a little bit inflated. And in fact, as if you look at how the battle went, you realize that there was a moment of properly in which these forces all equated each other on the field and we can't think of, of a properly a qualitative difference a, a, a huge qualitative difference that would compensate for the numerical gap between the Albanians and the Ottomans they were probably very similar in fighting in ways that um, resembled each other um, and and yet it's the generalship and the, 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 pre, the plan the, the, you know, the, the confidence Right, there is something almost um, really indeed there was some a mission here to accomplish, right? As we were saying, from a political, from a religious point of view, it was properly uh, a vision about what Albania had to be us to be free again of Ottoman domination. So it was something uh, that probably a lot of work also to boost the troops' morale and so on for the battle in that function. And so these people, that's how you compensate for lack of collective discipline enforced by a centralized state, right? You you give these men something to believe in, right? Also the fact of, of being so few that surprised the League. Uh, you have to think that probably also maybe the League didn't provide Skanderberg with so many troops, right? There were, there were jealousies, there were some fears legitimately that also Ottoman retaliation, etc. So he wanted to show something here. Right, and as a first battle, this was quite important. He realized that. Uh, consider also the, that the um, Castrati were, you know, family had ro risen to prominence in Albania because of Ottoman support. Right, they were the Ottomans were co-opting fundamentally all these local uh, elites to as we've seen, the same Skanderberg serving in their armies, and um, and that's how. Also politically, Skanderbeg was not just a no one, but somebody that had properly an ambition in the same Albania himself. And you know, also the, the national myth, you know, the fact that you know, even today's Albania's flag, as you know, has the the, the Castratic coat of arms, right? The double head um, eagle uh, of it's all of Byzantine influence fundamentally in the area. This was a Pyrrhus, etc. And the same Skanderbeg is, you know, it's the nickname that means. Alexander Bay would be yeah the, the local ruler government etc. In the, in the wake of Alexander, surely you know he wanted to collect even Pyrrhus legacy ideologically of all this kind of uh, national mythology, uh, and um, and these were people that you know would have been really interesting to 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 analyze psychologically. Meaning what what would have been in, 
in, can you imagine a 15th century in this case Albanian reality but you know even after all the, what had happened in the last two centuries I mean it had been a big thing the fact of the collapse of this ecumenic empire such as the Roman one to have banished and to have been filled now with all these foreign powers and the Turks swarming to this line it, it was a total mess it was a complete redrawing of all the, the political and military culture and all this and in a freaking mess that was exploited by these very, you know, ambitious and charismatic leaders to, to form their own their own power in danger, exploiting the, the, the local ambitions of, of independence and of, uh, you know, a defense against the foreign invasion. And, yeah, so we will keep talking naturally about uh, Skanderberg's uh, battles, um, his life, uh, Albanian history. This is just the first time we, we did it. And I know, by the way, these are uh, those kind of videos that, you know, every time you make a video about, about certain areas, you know, you have this wave of uh, either, you know, pro or against national nationalistic, you know, interest that derives. I, I, I can't tell you how many uh, senseless comments I got <laughs> under the Illyrian Helmet video, but it, it still makes views, and, and this allows also to to discuss the thing and people get interested it, I think it's positive at the end of the day so there is nothing propagandistic about my channel as you know I don't give a damn fundamentally wherever people come from or whatever we just talk about history and of course that's always biased but you know my objective is not to make it a political let's say properly a colored or national political bias of any sort or whatever uh, you know that we cover a lot of Ottoman history as well, so there is not. We have to cover, however, a lot of other countries' history. We we, sp we spoke recently about uh, Greece and medieval times, but we'll, uh, I've never made a video about Serbia, for example. Uh, a video about Valachia or Moldavia or, 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 or I don't know, Transylvania. Ha the same Hungary. We didn't make much, right? And there is really a lot to cover uh, instead. So I hope gradually... You see, even yesterday's video was about the great fear of the Turk, more or less, in these times. Actually, yes, exactly, in these times. Um, and uh, so we're gradually covering. Uh, my objective is to, is to cover everything, actually, in terms of medieval warfare, as you know, step by step. And, you know, I hope to, to be uh, able to do it. Time allowing and... Uh, all right, well, f for now we stop it here. However, this was Battle of Torviol. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.